from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Hello, I'm Frank Wright, and welcome to Kennedy Classics, part of the media ministry of Dr. D. James Kennedy. Be sure to visit our ministry website where you can find a wealth of digital resources, all from a biblical perspective. It's all available at djameskennedy.org. At an impasse in the Continental Congress, Benjamin Franklin rose to call the assembly to prayer with these words, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? This principle that God governs in the affairs of men is seen throughout the scriptures. The writer of Proverbs tells us, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And the apostle says the same thing to the New Testament church. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Nowhere was this reality more evident than in the passion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Powerful men seeking to protect their vested interests crucified the Lord of glory. Yet God rules in the affairs of men, even powerful men who seem to think they're beyond his reach. One such man was Josephus Caiaphas, who was high priest in Jerusalem when Jesus made his triumphal entry into the city. And here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with the personal story of this man in his message, I am Caiaphas. May we hear the word of God, John chapter 11, immediately after the raising of Lazarus, verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him, but some some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not only for that nation, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. And may God speak to us today from his holy word. May his name ever be praised. Amen. I don't want to be here. I don't know why I'm here. I don't associate with riffraff. And I have never seen in my entire life, so many heretics in one place. But I have been compelled to come and tell things as they really were from 
my perspective. And my perspective, of course, is the only one that counts. For of course I am Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel. And what I say is what is right. And it is right because I say it. And I suppose at least I will set the record straight and henceforth, though I doubt that it shall do any good since you are so blinded by your prejudices and superstitions, at least you will know the facts as they really were. And the first fact that you need to understand is that I, I, Caiaphas, am the one. Oh, you, you talk about your Judas who betrayed him, your Pilate who condemned him, your Longinus who nailed him to a cross. But what were they but mere instruments in my hands? I was the grand architect of the plan. I not only conceived it, but I carried it through and at every crucial point when it appeared that the plan was going to collapse, it was I who rescued it. Without me, it would never have happened. Yes, at least you will today learn more about me. And that will be your very high privilege. My name, as I said, is Caiaphas. And if you read Josephus, our historian, which probably you have not, you would know that my first name is Josephus. Josephus Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel. And we Sadducees are the aristocrats of Israel. We don't talk, we act. We are what you would call today the advance, the progressive party, or the liberal party. And though there may be no organized Sadducees today, and yet we are everywhere, even amongst you, the liberals, who, like us, don't believe in the resurrection. We don't believe in the soul. We don't believe in immortality. We don't believe in heaven or hell or angels or spirits or any other such superstitions as that. What we believe in is power. And I am a man of power. You see, Others may talk about principles and laws, but as far as I was concerned, what ruled in the world of power was expediency. And it was expedient that one man should die for the people and that the nation perish not. There was the plan. He should die. For if any man threatens my place, there is but one argument that is sufficient, and that is death. But sire, they said, what about Lazarus? Kill him too. What is one more peasant if it will secure my place? And then I advised them that it would be well not to do it on the feast day because there were so many of these rabid northerners from Galilee down that a tumult might arise. And so wait until after that, I said. Little did I know that that very night I would have ushered in my presence by an excited guard a little 
weaselly sort of man from the nearby town of Carioth. This man of Carioth, this Ish Cariot, was named Judas, and he was one of them. And glancing furtively from side to side, he came before me and lifted his eyes and said, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. Ah, said I, this is what the Pharisees would call providence. But believing in none of that kind of nonsense, I took it as simply a lucky fortune that he should fall, fall so easily into our hands. And though it were a feast day, we would take him by night and kill him and have him in his coffin before morning and before the people even knew what had happened. And so, with the temple guard, as well as some Romans, we went out and trapped him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And surprisingly, with little resistance, they bound him and brought him to me, but I sent him out of respect and deference to Annas, my father-in-law, who had been high priest before me and who was a man of great esteem in that city. And he questioned him for some while to no advantage and sent him bound unto me. And there he stood before me as I sat in my throne chair, looking up at this prisoner there on the other side, and several tears were the counselors of the law, the Sanhedrin, the high court of Israel. And I questioned him on many things, and he answered me not so much as a word, and I was astonished. But there was something about his eyes that when he looked at me, I felt that his gaze pierced all the way to the soul. And as he looked on one and another and another and another of the counselors, it seemed as if he weighed them, found them wanting, and judged them. And so I, even I, the high priest of God, felt almost as if I were on trial before him which is utter nonsense. So we brought our witnesses, and they began to make their accusations. But as you know, we must have two witnesses that agree. And these ignorant dolts could not agree on anything, but continued one after another to contradict themselves, until a great sense of frustration and then almost a panic began to seize the entire Sanhedrin. And various counselors looked at me with a look of what shall we do? And then I was struck with a brilliant stratagem. Uh, the Sanhedrin was so fortunate to have a brilliant man like myself to lead them. No wonder I had this place. I was a man for the times. And so I said to him, leaping from my chair, and appearing to be quite indignant, I said, what are these things which they witness against you? And then I said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. He said, I am. And furthermore, he had the audacity to say, and henceforth you shall see the Son of Man descending from heaven, coming in the clouds. What incredible blasphemy. And so I shouted, blasphemy, blasphemy, this man had committed blasphemy. And I turned to the counselors and said, what think ye? And as one voice they said, he is guilty of death. Was that magnificently handled or not? They said, what about Pilate? You know that we cannot put any man to death. I said, you leave Pilate to me. 
He is but a puppet in my hands. And Pilate caved in as I thought he would and turned him over, washing his hands ceremoniously to us to take and crucify. But I was not satisfied yet and followed shortly after the mob out to the hill of execution, Calvary. And there we watched as his hands and feet were secured to the cross and he was lifted up naked before the people. Now I knew that I had succeeded. I had dispensed with your Jesus. However, not three days had passed until one of my servants came rushing into my chamber, breathlessly bringing within him, with him an entire Roman guard. And they told the most incredible story that that very morning that angels had descended from heaven and had rolled back the huge stone that blocked the entrance to the tomb. And then that this Jesus, whom we hung upon a cross, walked out of the tomb, and all of the guards fled. Now, I neither believed in angels, nor did I believe in the resurrection, but I didn't know what to make of this, and I knew as a practical man that the people would make much of it. And so again, strategist that I was, I called for large sums of money and put many gold coins into the hands of each of these guards, And I told them to say nothing of what they had said to me, but rather I said, say this. While we slept, his disciples came by night and stole away the body. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. And I noticed that this story is still being told by some today, how gullible people are. And so I brought Peter and John, two of their leaders, who supposedly had healed a a man that was lame from birth. I brought them all before me. And as I was lecturing them not to teach in the name of this Jesus anymore, I looked again a second time at this man that stood with them and was shocked to recognize him. This, This was that man that I had seen for decades sitting at the gate called Beautiful, carried there every morning by friends or relatives, begging. How he stood or walked, I had no idea. But I still commanded them to stop, but they would not. Soon thousands and then more thousands right in Jerusalem believed, and I called them back again and commanded them to stop speaking in the name of this Jesus, lest they bring down upon our heads his blood. And they said, whether it be right to listen to you or to obey God, judge you, but we cannot but tell those things which we have seen and heard. And I was furious and I commanded they be taken and beaten and thrown into prison. And then I was told that angels had come and set him free. And it continued to grow and grow. And I began to see that my plan of expediency was not working. First thing you know, Pontius Pilate, who condemned him, was removed by Caesar from his place. And then the new procurator removed me from my place. And then the Romans came and destroyed our nation. And everything happened that I had sought to keep from happening. And now, I am an old man. But I have been faithful to my beliefs as a Sadducee. And despite all of these things, I have not believed in angels or resurrections spirits or immortality or heaven and hell. 
I was told that this Judas Ishkarioth had gone and hanged himself. And someone said that he went to his place, which was hell. Well, I don't believe in that, and I hope that you will not believe it. There is no hell, there is no retribution, there is no resurrection. That is utterly nonsense. I stand by my beliefs as a former high priest of Israel. I am being summoned. I must go. I must leave you now. But I hear that there is a place which has been prepared for me. My place again. I will have my place. Oh, this is what I have wanted. At long last, I go, I go to my place. Out of the very depths of hell, may the testimony of Caiaphas, the false high priest, speak to our hearts. Now he knows that the resurrection is real, that retribution is true, that hell exists. Ah, but too late, too late, he knows. He knows that those that trust in the crucified one will have eternal life. He knows that even the plan that he conceived to place him on a cross has resulted that that cross has become the means of the salvation of men. We thank thee, O God, for one thing, and that is that there was a time in the great conception of this plan when the false high priest and the true high priest agreed in the very same thing, that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Caiaphas said, take him. And Jesus said, take me. Father, we thank Thee that the voluntary death of Christ upon the cross has become our hope of life eternal. And Lord, should there be any here this day who may be on their way to their place with Him, may they hear the words of Jesus who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me shall never perish, but have everlasting life. For I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. How about you, friend? Do you want to know life eternal in heaven someday?
then pray with me this prayer right now. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins and to purchase a place for me in heaven. Please forgive me of my sins of thought, word, and deed. I place my trust in you from this day forward. In your name I pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we have a special gift we'd like to send you. It's Beginning Again, the book written by Dr. Kennedy for new believers. In these pages, you'll learn how to read and study the Bible, how to pray, and even how to share Christ with others. To receive your copy of Beginning Again, just write to our address or call our toll-free number. God bless you. The Apostles' testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed everything. It turned the world upside down, and it still makes a transformational impact in our world today. This powerful character study of Caiaphas gives us a harrowing picture of what it means to disbelieve that biblical testimony. Dr. Kennedy, of course, was a master at making the living words of the Bible jump off the page like this, and his unique teaching continues to benefit a whole new generation. That is why we are so excited to offer the D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible. This new Bible is now available and is the product of nearly 50 years of Dr. Kennedy's ministry. His insights and bold proclamation of the truth are needed today more than ever. And hundreds of his articles, character sketches, doctrinal teachings, and insightful cultural observations are pulled together for the first time in the new D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible. This Bible is truly the resource for today's times, addressing issues from whether the Bible teaches socialism to how to answer objections about Christianity from skeptics. We would like to send you a new leather-bound copy of this new Bible right away as our thanks for your generous donation of $100 or more to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6087, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 888-633-1728, or go online to djameskennedy.org. And for a limited time, if you're able to give $200 or more, we will send you a copy of the D. James Kennedy Topical Study Bible, and we will send another one to a pastor or seminary student. This teaching needs to be proclaimed again from America's pulpits. So help us put these Bibles into the hands of current and future pastors. Simply write to us at Box 6087, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 888-633-1728, or go online to djameskennedy.org. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us on Kennedy Classics. We'll see you next time. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.